Hello, and thank you for joining the National Multiple Sclerosis Society's live webcast, The Next Frontier, Understanding and Treating Progressive MS, coming to you live from New York. I'm Dr. Timothy Kutsi, Chief Research Officer of the National MS Society and the moderator of today's program. Progressive MS is an important focus for the National MS Society. We take a comprehensive research strategy and funding projects around the world to stop MS, restore function, and end MS forever for all forms of the disease, including progressive MS. MS progression can be slow or it can be fast, but it occurs in many people who have MS, even in people successfully treated for relapses. Addressing the challenges of progressive MS is an urgent unmet need. People with progressive MS often tell me that they feel like they're being ignored. While we understand their frustration, I wonder how many in our audience know that virtually every therapy available today for relapsing MS has also been tested in progressive forms of MS. Unfortunately, the treatments just didn't work in progressive MS. We're still not sure why they failed, but we're working harder than ever to overcome this hurdle. During this webcast, we'll address issues that we know matter to our viewers, such as why aren't there more therapies for people with progressive MS? Why is it so hard to understand progressive MS? And what's on the horizon for repairing the nervous system? To help us better understand and explore these issues, I am pleased to be joined by three panelists who not only recognize this important work, but who have played a significant part in advancing research, knowledge, and clinical care. Let me introduce them. Dr. Peter Calabrese is a professor of neurology at the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine and the director of the Johns Hopkins MS Center. Dr. Calabrese is also the recipient of a five-year collaborative MS Research Center award focusing on nervous system repair and MS. Welcome, Peter. Thank you. Next, we have Dr. John DeLuca. Dr. DeLuca is vice president for research at the Kessler Foundation Research Center. He is also professor of physical medicine and rehabilitation and professor of neurology and neurosciences at the University of Medicine and Dentistry of New Jersey. As an expert in MS cognition, Dr. DeLuca is training the next generation of experts in this field with the help of a National MS Society mentor-based fellowship in rehabilitation research. Thanks for being here, John. Happy to be here. Thank you. In addition, we have Dr. Daniel Reich. Dr. Reich is Chief of Translational Neuroradiology Unit at the Neuroimmunology Branch at the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke. He is also Adjunct Assistant Professor at the Departments of Radiology, Neurology, and Biostatistics at Johns Hopkins University. Welcome, Danny. Thank you. So before we kick off our discussion, let's talk a bit about what progressive MS is, which in short is any form of worsening MS. Currently, we know there are four types of MS. There's relapsing remitting MS, primary progressive MS, secondary progressive MS, and progressive relapsing MS. For more information on these different types of MS, I invite you to go to our website, nationalmssociety.org. Now, let's talk specifically with our panelists about progressive MS. And just as a reminder to our viewers, if you have a question that you would like answered, please use the submit a question box at the bottom of your screen. So Peter, you've conducted clinical trials in MS and have been treating people with MS for many years. Can you explain why there aren't more treatments for progressive MS? Well, Tim, as you said, it's not for lack of trying. We've used all of the FDA-approved drugs that are indicated for relapsing MS uh, in progressive MS, and uh, so far they haven't worked, although some of those trials are still mm -hmm. ongoing. Uh, but I think the real issue is that the underlying mechanism of progressive MS may be different than relapsing mm -hmm. MS. And by that, I mean that in relapsing MS, we understand that there's inflammation, and we know how to target the inflammation. The drugs we have are good at modulating the immune cells. But in progressive MS, there's a different process going on. The nerves themselves become unhappy from the loss of myelin, and we need to figure out how to rescue those nerves and keep them happier and, and target uh, remyelination, as we'll talk about later, and rescuing the nerves. And so I think the key to progressive MS is getting a better understanding of what's happening in the brain spinal cord, targeting that more specifically in addition to the anti-inflammatories that we have right now. Oh, interesting. So what you're saying is that we have to take a different approach to treating progressive MS. Um, so Danny, uh, do you think that part of the problem is that pharmaceutical companies aren't interested in doing trials in progressive MS? Well, I don't 
I don't think that's really the problem here. I think the problem is that it's very hard to do a trial in progressive MS. As Peter was saying, unlike in relapsing MS, where we have um, good medicines because we know that a lot of the problem is inflammation, in progressive MS, we don't really know exactly what the problem is and how to target it. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of new drugs, new ideas for new therapies that are coming out, but what we don't yet have is a really great way of testing them. Mm -hmm. Currently, there are to do a trial in progressive MS takes several years and lots and lots and lots of patients, and we need to come up with new and better ways of doing that. And there are trials that are going on that drug companies are running, that investigators at universities all over the world are also running. And from these trials, we are learning better ways of, of uh, targeting and doing the trials. Mm -hmm. Okay, so finding ways to measure progression so that you don't have to w wait years to see whether or not a therapy works is important. Um, Danny, I know that at NIH, your teams are also conducting clinical trials in progressive MS. Uh, can you tell us a bit about the trial that you're running? Sure, sure, I'd be happy to. We have two trials that are going on right now. One of them is for primary progressive MS, and what we're testing is a drug that we think will improve the brain's ability to make energy. and. Uh, nerve cells in the brain need energy in order to do their work, uh, and so we need to find ways, and this is a real problem in progressive MS, so we need to find ways of improving the brain's ability to make energy, mm -hmm. and so that's one of the drugs we're testing. We're also doing a trial in secondary progressive MS, and in that uh, trial what we're testing is whether we can reduce any inflammation that's left over in progressive MS by giving medicine both through the blood and also through the spinal tap directly into the spinal fluid, a powerful anti-inflammatory medication. And if people are, are interested in these trials, uh, we are still recruiting for them and they can call our clinical office. Okay. I can give you the number for that. Great. And we have the number on our screen. So, um, you know, I'm, and, and certainly we encourage people to visit our website where they can learn more information on that. Um, I, I'm sure that our viewers are interested <clears throat> that there is progress. Um, I know, John, that you, you've done work with a rehab technique called uh, self-generation to improve memory. Can you tell us what that is and how might a person who lives with progressive MS use that at home? Well, yes, Tim. Actually, there are a, a number of behavioral techniques that uh, we've been able to study to improve uh, learning and memory in persons with MS. And they're all based on the idea that persons with MS have problems primarily in the learning of information, not in retrieving that information from the brain when it's stored. And if the problem is difficulty in learning, then the behavioral techniques have to be focused on making sure they learn. And once they learn the information, they'll be able to recall that pretty much like, uh, like, like all of us. And so self-generation is an interesting technique. It's been known for, uh, for decades. It's used with uh, individuals with learning disabilities, for example. And it's a simple idea. And that is, to learn new information, you will remember it better if you generate the answer yourself than if someone tells you the answer. Mm -hmm. It sounds like a very simple concept, and it's very powerful. The uh, amount of information that can be retained through self-generation is about 50% better than if someone just provides the information. So it's, it's trying to learn the information by generating it itself. It causes a stronger code in the brain that can be retrieved. Another example, for example, that we've looked at is something called uh, reminding yourself. It's called space retrieval. And the idea of not, if you want to learn something, you can study it or you can, and you can study it again. But if you're sort of quizzing yourself on it, that quizzing actually increases the strength of the information in the brain and it makes it a lot easier to, re to retrieve. So if you put together things like self-generate something that you need to learn, and remind yourself of that and come up with a system of how you use that. We can show about 50% improvement in learning and memory individuals. So it's best to try to work with the rehabilitation team to do that because it sounds like an easy concept, but how you do it in your real life can be somewhat of a challenge. So it sounds like there's things that people can do right now to help with their cognition, and that, that's really important to know. Uh, but I know that people want to know what can be do done to stop MS progression. So, Peter, I know you've been researching ways to protect the nervous system from damage in MS. Um, what have you and others found uh, on this so far? Well, Tim, we're looking at a lot of different things. Uh, it's a challenging problem, as we've talked about, but uh, we're looking 
uh, at how uh, nerve cells survive and the signals that are required to keep them alive. And so uh, we're screening uh, drugs, uh, compounds that may be already available. A lot of people are talking about repurposing drugs, so a drug that's already indicated by the FDA for one disease, maybe we uh, could find that it has neuroprotective effects uh, in our model. So we're doing high throughput screens there. We're also trying to uh, find out how we can repair the tissue, of course. And so uh, remyelination is, is very important, and we're just starting to get ideas about how to do that. We actually know that within all of our brains, there are cells that have the capacity to turn into myelin-making cells. We call these uh, oligodendrocyte mm -hmm. precursor cells. The oligodendrocyte makes myelin, and there's a precursor cell, mm -hmm. kind of like a stem cell, but different, because stem cells can become any different kind of cell, and this precursor cell uh, seems to be more selectively geared towards becoming a myelin-making cell. And if we can figure out how to turn these cells on and get them to turn into myelin-making cells, we could actually repair tissue. Mm -hmm. And as Danny said, the, the next big issue is, okay, suppose we, we have a drug that seems to work in the laboratory. How are we going to take it to the clinic and, and test it? And so we focused a lot, put a lot of effort into imaging biomarkers of remyelination and uh, neuroprotection, trying to get at issues separate from the inflammation that we talked about, which is so prominent in relapsing MS. And so it turns out that there's some new MRI techniques uh, and a new eye imaging technique called optical coherence tomography that gives us almost a microscopic picture of the nerves in the back of the eye. And I think this, this could be very promising as a way of directly imaging the health of the nerves. And, may give us that rapid feedback that we're looking for to test some of these compounds as we transition into the clinic. So it sounds like MS, is, the research in this area is going really fast and all, lots of tools that you're developing. Exactly, exactly. It's an exciting time. Excellent. Well, I know that you, part of this is that, you know, the Society um, recently awarded you with a collaborative MS Research Center Award to uh, find ways to repair damage. Um, you know, tell us a bit about that collaboration and tell us why why is nervous system repair so hard? Well, uh, first of all, uh, I think nervous system repair is so hard because there are a lot of different things that may be happening. In some patients, it may be uh, microscopic inflammation. We know that there are immune cells that are what we call resident immune cells, the glial cells that uh, are hard to understand because we don't always have access to the tissue that we can take blood and spinal fluid, but we're only indirectly looking at what's happening in the brain. Uh, and then there, uh, some patients uh, have demyelination, uh, other patients have more neurodegeneration where their axons are damaged, and so it may be playing out differently mm -hmm. in different people. But the, uh, the Collaborative Center Award approach, I think, is really exciting. Uh, we had one before, and, and the idea here is that we tap into expertise in other areas, and so uh, two established MS investigators collaborate with people from different fields, and so we're working with a myelin biologist, a, a PhD scientist, Dr. Dwight Burgles, who specializes in understanding how myelination happens in the first place. Uh, and using uh, tools that he's developed in his lab, we can now better understand uh, how we can maybe recapitulate this in older people and get the myelin to come back, uh, almost to dial back the clock and make our bodies think that we're children again and we need to, to myelinate. And through understanding how it happens normally, we can use Mother Nature's expertise and perhaps trigger that to happen in patients with MS. Uh, and then we have another investigator, uh, Dr. Jeff Rothstein, who's working on another disease called ALS where there's degeneration. And I think it's very important that there be crosstalk so that we can understand lessons that have been learned from that disease and apply them to MS. And so it's an exciting time, and I think this kind of collaboration is really critical to making progress move forward quickly. That's terrific. It's really inspiring. It's exciting to see that much progress. Um, John, let me ask you, um, can, can the brain rewire itself and create new paths inside the brain? Oh, absolutely. Uh, it's really based on the concept of neuroplasticity. And the brain has a number of natural responses to, to damage. And one of those responses is uh, areas that are around the part of damage in the brain sort of take on, the, take up the slack, if you will. They sort of take up some of the, the neural tissue that's required to do that task. And that's actually one of the best ways that the brain shows uh, a way to reorganize. Uh, another way that the brain does that is it takes uh, tissue or, or areas on the other side of the, of the brain, sort of two sides of the brain. So on the other side, it'll recruit areas from the other side, sort of as if to help with the, uh, the damaged area to try to see if we can actually um, 
improve behavior or whatever it might be. And the third way the brain tr tries to repair itself is by taking tissue uh, around the areas of the brain, maybe not necessarily around the damage or around the other hemisphere, but other resources, to take collectively those resources to try to m make it so that the symptoms of MS can be overcome. So the brain has a very nice way of reorganizing and it, and it's, we're learning a lot more about how the environment mm -hmm. can actually change the brain. And I think that's very exciting for MS. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm going to pause here. Danny, uh, your reaction, what, you know, you've heard Peter and, and, and John, and <coughs> why is it so hard? And why are, why are we so excited? Well, I think there's a lot of good research going on. Um, I think we're, we're getting at really basic mechanisms of, of, of how the progression happens. Um, there's a lot that's not known, and that kind of work is really, really hard to do. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but it is an exciting time, mm -hmm. as everybody said. Sounds like it's a holistic, we need a holistic approach and research across the board. Um, let me follow up with John um, by asking whether behavioral treatments that, that can result in changes in brain organization and, you know, tell us a bit about the kinds of treatments that can be used to do that. It's really, uh, Tim, very exciting. Like I say, you know, we know that, for example, if we do, if you're learning to play the piano, that um, you start off really slow with your hands and your fingers and then after a while, it starts getting faster. That's because the brain is reorganizing. And the brain is taking other areas to help out. Well, you do the same thing with behavior. We just completed a, uh, a clinical trial of a behavioral intervention. And we had a, um, a group that got this significant intervention um, to improve learning and a placebo group. And it was the people who had the intervention that showed significant more significantly more activation in a variety of regions around the brain. Uh, so the brain, we can, we can mold it in such a way that it can increase its capacity to learn. And that's what's very exciting for the areas of cognition. Can you tell us a bit about that intervention that you're, you're describing? Sure. Well, the intervention was based on two concepts that we've known for decades that improve the learning of information. One is imagery. So we teach our patients how to use imagery to improve the learning of information. And the second is context. So when people tell you a story or they're telling you something about what happened or that happened yesterday that's important to them, we tra train people to learn the context. Put that into a context rather than like memorizing words. And we've known that if you train imagery in context, that it'll significantly improve the, the strength of that code in your brain. And if it's stronger in your brain, it's easier for you to find it when you need it. And we, in our intervention showed pre and post fMRI imaging that the people who got the training showed significantly more activation as well as did better behaviorally. Well, so it sounds like there's great Im implications of this research for people with MS today. Um, let me shift gears a bit um, and come back to Danny and ask you, um, we've heard that silent, that silent progression uh, uh, in, and t in tissue injury can be detected using MRI even when a person isn't feeling worse. Um, what does that tell us about progression and what's happening to the brain in progression? Yeah, unfortunately that's true. It's, it's definitely the case that the disease may even be progressing um, and we can see that on MRI even if people are in remission. Um, and there's a few ways that this can happen. One way it happens is something we've known for a long time is that people can get new plaques Mm -hmm. um, even when they don't develop symptoms, and that can be seen on MRI. Another way that that can happen is that some of the damage that has occurred due to the inflammation, um, uh, that there can actually be some loss of, of the brain cells and the brain tissues, and what we can see is that the size of the brain is actually getting a little bit smaller in this disease. Mm -hmm. And we think that's related also to the progression. It happens uh, on average about twice as fast in multiple sclerosis as it does in the rest of us. Um, and the third way that it can happen, and this is probably really important, is that there's low-grade sort of um, quiet um, inflammation uh, that is occurring throughout the brain. Um, and that process may be getting more and more significant as the disease goes on. Um, and that may also be contributing to the progression that we see. See. So I, I've heard that you know lesions can disappear or shrink as seen on MRI. Um, does that mean that you know when they disappear that they're they're they've been repaired or are actively being repaired? Well, that's a great question. It it certainly can mean that, and that's of course the goal. Um, and the 
uh, treatments to improve the myelination that uh, Peter was talking about certainly are, are, are targeted to try to mm -hmm. do that. Um, it's not the only thing that can make a plaque get smaller. Mm -hmm. um, we know there's a lot of swelling in plaques. There's water, uh, just as if you were to get a, uh, um, an injury on your arm and there's some swelling, that can go down as well, just part of the normal course of, of repairing. Um, and as I mentioned, also sometimes they get uh, uh, smaller because there's been some loss of, of brain cells um, and, and uh, the brain is just sort of cleaning that up. Um, but uh, one of the challenges for us, uh, those of us who are interested in, in, um, uh, in imaging and trying to look inside people at the processes that are, are going on in this disease, is to figure out how to see the repair that's happening that we know is going on. Um, and that's something we're working really hard on. Okay. Peter, you're, tell me a, your, your reaction and you know this, this repair that happens, do you see that in patients, that, that it can have benefit? Well, we do. I think that's an important point. Uh, some people don't ap appreciate that with the drugs that we have right now, uh, a not un unsubstantial um, uh, proportion of patients actually improve. And this has been seen in, in all of the phase three trials from the, the first line drugs, interferon and clotiramer and, and uh, perhaps much more so with natalizumab, but uh, some of the patients actually get better. Now, these drugs are not designed to remyelinate by themselves, but what I think is happening is if one successfully dampens the inflammation um, to the point where there's, there's very little inflammation, that some of these natural reparative uh, pathways can start to kick in, the, what I call Mother Nature's uh, mm -hmm. healing. And so that we do see a substantial number of patients have uh, remyelination, and some patients get better when they go on therapy, which is very encouraging. Now, of course, there are other people who uh, do not and, and start to progress, and we need to target that. But I feel as if it, it is happening. The, the drugs that we're getting are, are better and stronger, and we're making a lot of progress there. Mm -hmm. Wow, so being able to harness, harness our natural repair mechanisms in the brain sounds like a really exciting area. Yes. So this sounds so promising. Um, let's take some qu questions from our audience. Um, uh, here's one for Danny, again. We're picking on you today. Um, Kevin would like to know how many participants have been chosen for uh, the NIH studies that you're uh, recruiting for. We've um, enrolled about 30 people so far. Mm -hmm. um, both of the trials that I mentioned, the one for progress primary progressive MS, the other for secondary progressive MS, still have openings mm -hmm. uh, for them. As you mentioned, you can go to the MS Society website um, and find out uh, how to enroll. The, the, um, uh, the NIH, where I work, National Institutes of Health, has um, uh, put a large emphasis on, on these trials, um, and as a result, uh, we are recruiting nationwide for them. Okay, great. So, um, another question for, for Danny, actually. Uh, Jada has asked her, you know, if, uh, if an MRI has unchanged for many years, is there any reason for her to continue to have her annual MRI? It's another great question, um, and it's a hard one to answer. I think I might uh, even turn to Peter for his opinion. Um, Peter also uh, sees a lot of patients. Um, uh, but I would say that if things are really stable and, and, and the MRI is really not changing and, um, and there aren't uh, new clinical symptoms and things, things really are, are going well, um, then it's reasonable to drop back on the frequency. Right. Peter? Yeah. Well, I, I agree with Danny. In the beginning, um, as Danny said, there can be a lot of silent disease, so we tend to do it once a year. Uh, but as time goes on, if someone is extremely stable for several years, I'll back off to every other year. And, and then there's some patients who really you haven't seen any new activity for five or ten years, and so uh, uh, we can back off a little bit as time goes on. But in the beginning, during the relapsing stage, I think it is important to, to get MRIs more frequently. Thank you. Um, so, Peter, a couple more questions for you. Um, Beth is wondering how she knows if her MS is becoming more progressive. And uh, Steve also asks, why do so many people turn, uh, become progressive? Well, these are great questions. And the issue of uh, am I becoming progressive uh, is, is really a, a, such a challenging one that the National MS Society has convened a, a panel to address this because clinically it, it's a little bit hard to say from just talking to a patient or, or even following them over many years. And we, I urge some caution uh, before calling someone uh, progressive for a variety of reasons. First, I've had the experience that some patients actually have 
lots of little exacerbations. And when you're seeing them every six months or, or every 12 months and you think that they have progressed over that period of time, what you don't know is whether there have been lots of little attacks and it's been mediated by chronic inflammation, which is responsive to the therapies that we have. Um, second, uh, there can be medical problems. So I've seen patients who have uh, untreated iron deficiency or B12 deficiency or thyroid problems or even depression that can mask as slow worsening of their disease. So it's important to take the holistic approach. Talk to your patients, find out what's going on in their lives. Is there something else that is, is making them worse? But ultimately, after a year or two uh, and you can't identify any other cause, then we start to become more comfortable. And for me, it's really a, a diagnosis that I make retrospectively. We kind of look back and say, well, you know, I think you may have become progressive. And of course, that's very different from the proactive approach that we take in relapsing disease, where identifying the inflammation and being aggressive up front is important. And part of that's because we have less that we, we can offer for progressive disease. But uh, we, we always uh, offer people uh, rehabilitation, which is really important. Uh, I think we'll should talk about exercise because uh, more and more it appears that exercise can not only help the brain but improve function and, and one should never ignore the, the power of rehabilitation. Mm -hmm. It sounds also like you're saying that um, we need more research to really help us define and understand progressive MS even better than we do today. Well, that, that's exactly right because some of the processes that Danny was talking about are happening in the brain and we just don't have uh, access uh, to the brain in a microscopic way uh, yet to fully understand what's going on. But I think that as we start to understand the, the complex interplay between uh, the demyelination, the dying of the nerves, and this inflammation that comes from the glial cells, the uh, immune cells that live in the brain, uh, we will get better at targeting that specifically. Uh, why do so many people become aggressive? Well, I, I think it has to do with not treating the early stages of the disease uh, effectively in, in some cases, but in other people it may be that they predominantly have problems with, uh, for example, the, the mitochondria, the energy packs of the cells that Danny was talking about. And we're finding that in other diseases like Parkinson's disease, what uh, these uh, mitochondria and the, the lack of energy may be a problem. And of course, this is a, we recognize this clinically in MS, but uh, we haven't fully explored whether maybe we could target mitochondrial dysfunction more effectively uh, using cocktails of drugs, not just one approach. So I think we're going to enter into an era where we have patients on anti-inflammatories and then we try to understand better what's driving their progression and if it's an energy demand problem go one direction, if it's a myelin problem go in a different direction and uh, try different combination approaches. That's really remarkable. Um, so let's ask John a question. Um, Deborah says that uh, she has progressive MS, uh, is no longer able to walk. Um, can, Ampira, can a drug like Ampira help her? Well, well, Deborah, um, you know, um, if you really are unable to walk, it's unclear if Ampere would help, and, and primarily because the, the clinical trials uh, that, uh, for Ampere were based on some ability to walk. Um, it did include some people who are in a wheelchair, uh, but he had to have some ability to walk because what Ampere is designed to do is to improve, improve walking speed. So if you really are unable to walk, then it's unclear. If there is some ability to walk, then it, it's possible. I think it's promising. I think, you know, if there's, it probably wouldn't hurt, but it would be something certainly to try with your healthcare professional. Yeah, and I want to pause here and just uh, talk a little more about this with Peter and, and Danny. You know, part of, you know, drugs like Ampira are managing symptoms. And um, do you, are you seeing more and more of that as part of um, treating uh, people with MS, particularly progressive forms of MS? Absolutely. And I think the, the conversation with my patients uh, uh, covers many different aspects. First, we confirm the diagnosis, make sure we have that correct. Uh, second, we rule out confounding uh, illnesses like the, the medical problems that can happen to people with MS or any other disease. Uh, and, and then we, we talk about the uh, immune modulating therapies and the symptomatic therapies. And there's a lot to do for progressive <coughs> MS with respect to managing symptoms that can improve quality of life, relieving pain. Uh, properly treating the depression, treating the bladder dysfunction, and the rehabilitation approaches with stretching and exercise can all really have a great impact on quality of life. Right. Danny, any, anything to add? I think I would just echo one thing Peter said earlier, um, which is that I think in, in the end what we'll be doing is trying to target what we think is going on in progressive MS very, very early on in the disease. Mm -hmm. um, not everybody gets progressive, and we'd like nobody to get progressive. 
Um, and in order to prevent that, I think in the end that we're going to be treating people very, very early, even before they get that way. Mm -hmm. Great, um, Peter. Um, Marsha asks, um, when will be there? Some, when will there be a treatment to reverse damage? Well, as I said, I actually uh, have had the experience uh, that many of my patients get better uh, with some of the treatments they're on. So that quieting the inflammation and letting Mother Nature repair, harnessing that, uh, is partially effective in some people. But the, the real issue is when will we have a, a therapy that directly targets that process. So we're actually entering the era of remyelinating therapies. So these cells that I talked about, the oligodendrocyte precursor cells that have the capacity to turn into a myelin-making cell, uh, exist in our brain, and there is one trial that's already underway with a, a compound called Antilingo that seems to target these cells, and the idea is to wake them up and get them to turn into myelin-making cells. Now that all the preclinical data look very promising, it induces remyelination in a tissue culture dish, it improves myelination and function in models of MS, but as we uh, move into the clinic, uh, we, we have to have the right outcome measure. So the, the phase one was completed, it seems to be safe, gets into the brain, it's not toxic because the, the target is only on these cells, so that's all good. But the phase two trials will be, uh, I think, very informative uh, about how we can measure the remyelination. One will be predominantly using MRI in our conventional outcome measures uh, in the time of a relapse to see if we can get better recovery from the relapse. And probably a, a second trial design would be uh, using the eye imaging and seeing if at the time of a, an eye attack with optic neuritis, can we get remyelination in the optic nerve? And we know how to measure that much better now with a variety of these new modern technologies. And, and I think if, if this trial success, is successful, well, it'll really open up a, a whole pathway where, by which new drugs can be tested and we'll see more and more happen. Setting the stage for the future, that's exactly, so, so exactly. remarkable. Uh, another question for you, Peter, from Meredith, who is wondering, um, are there any um, treatments that can manage pain? Well, pain is, is very tough, uh, as you know, and I think the first thing is to identify what kind of pain it is. So sometimes patients have pain from spasticity and muscle cramping, mm -hmm. and uh, in addition to the, some of the drugs that we have out there now, there are clinical trials going on with new drugs to target spasticity. However, there's also central pain, and this is less well understood. It, there are pain relay centers in the part of the brain called the thalamus, and uh, the National MS Society is now sponsoring research, as you know, to mm -hmm. try to better understand pain so that we can target it. But uh, one of the drugs that was just approved for uh, mood disorders is out now actually being tested for pain. We talked about repurposing drugs, and sometimes in a clinical trial with a drug that's targeting mood, you find that pain actually gets mm -hmm. better. And right. so uh, this will be formally tested, uh, and I understand that uh, they are looking for patients for that trial. Right. There's a, um, it, it is, you know, important, an important area. And, you know, the National um, MS Society's goals are for progressive MS are to find out what drives it, to discover new therapies, to stop progression, restore function, and find better ways to manage symptoms and, and improve quality of life. Um, John, um, what are some of the frontiers in rehabilitation that you and others are, are doing to improve the quality of life for people living with MS? Well, you know, Tim, one of the uh, more exciting things that are going on uh, right now in rehabilitation, and particularly in cognition, is, uh, is realizing and discovering that environmental factors can actually decrease symptoms, particularly cognition. So we've done a series of studies where we've looked at individuals who've achieved, uh, who've had a higher lifetime intellectual achievement. That is, people who did a lot of reading, who had, who were more involved in, in educational activities. Uh, and and we, we look at individuals who have higher in educational uh, intellectual attainment and compare them to individuals with lower intellectual attainment, people who didn't go to school or don't read a lot, that we find is that people with higher intellectual attainment have fewer cognitive problems than the other group. And in fact, what's important about that is they have less cognitive problems, but they had the same degree of atrophy. So the, the, um, the impact of the disease was the same, but individuals who were involved throughout their lives in a lot of intellectual activity sort of built a brain that was more resistant to the expression of the disease. They didn't show the cognitive effects. It's really exciting to show that environmental factors can have that kind of an effect. 
We also, and, and, and Peter had mentioned exercise, we did a, a study where we asked patients um, 20 years ago, tell us about your cognitive lifestyle and your physical lifestyle. And what we found was people who were self-reported doing a lot more aerobic activity as opposed to who did not, they had better cognitive problems, they had fewer, uh, they, they, they had uh, less gray matter um, uh, loss and less white matter loss. So there's less brain loss, actually, and better cognitive problems if they were involved in a lot of aerobic activity throughout their lives. Same thing with cognition. If they were involved in a lot of cognitive activity, we see greater cognitive activity and less loss. That's really exciting to me. It really begs the question then, well, can we build a cognitive reserve? So let's say a patient with MS is 25 years old. Can we, as part of our rehabilitation, then say to that patient, well, we need to prescribe for you an exercise regimen. If you read one book a month, you start reading two or three. We need to build this reserve so that when you're older, while the disease might progress, the expression of the disease may not. Mm -hmm. I think it's really exciting to think about how the environmental factors like this can sort of uh, mediate this impact of the disease on the brain and, and everyday life. So, so would it be uh, accurate to say that people with MS should consider investigating uh, rehab programs and other exercise um, therapy strategies to help them improve how they feel? Oh, absolutely. Uh, I absolutely agree with that. I think that rehabilitation is going to be the key. It's not just medication. Medication is going to have an effect on the disease but rehabilitation can have an effect on the expression of the disease. Mm -hmm. So I would go to rehabilitation centers, work with uh, therapists, cognitive and physical, to see how you can come up and prescribe cognitive and, and exercise activities. Be active mm -hmm. in that. So really take a comprehensive approach to managing uh, your care. I think we have to. I think the medication approach is, is an is a, a incredibly important one to manage the disease. I think the patient then takes an approach to manage how their symptoms can be uh, expressed by the environment. It sounds like a real partnership between an individual and their health care provider. Absolutely. Uh, Peter, I want to come back to you and talk a bit more uh, uh, laboratory research. Um, so tell us a bit more about um, the approaches that you and other researchers are taking to stimulate uh, my, uh, nervous system repair in MS. Well, I think one of the most exciting areas right now is remyelination. Uh, and, of course, uh, people know about stem cells, and they're, in a way, the holy grail, the idea that we could put in a cell that could repair tissue of, of any type. Uh, one of the areas that seems to be really accelerating moving forward quickly right now is these uh, endogenous stem cells, the so one that uh, so are in our brain, and, and we are learning the cues to turn them into myelin-making cells. So we talked about antilingo. Our laboratory is screening compounds in a tissue culture dish that enhance the differentiation or the, the change from a precursor cell into a myelin-making cell. And we have a high-throughput system where the cells change color. They're red when they're precursor cells and turn green when they become myelin-making cells. And we can screen many compounds in a tissue culture dish and find which ones turn, turn on those cells. So that's exciting. Uh, we're also doing the same with, with nervous system tissue, trying to figure out <coughs> why the, the neurons uh, die or become unhappy and how we can rescue them. Now, of course, once the cell's dead, we can't rescue it, but the idea here is that there are probably many cells that are in a state where they're damaged but not dead, and we can rescue them. And um, I like to think, you know, I think when I talk to my patients, they ask them, you, you probably have good days and bad days, and they all say, yes, you know, some days actually when I'm feeling well, I can do much more than other days. And to me, that, that tells me that enough of the wiring is still intact mm -hmm. that there's something there to rescue. And so I'm really optimistic that through some of these approaches of learning how to rescue the dying cells and get them to turn on and function better, uh, that we'll actually be able to uh, translate that into the clinic. And then one of the, the final areas of research, which I think is much more practical, is, is the exercise approach. So we're using uh, bicycles, called FES bicycles, for functional electrical stimulation. And the idea here is that a lot of patients tell me, well, I hear you, I'd like to exercise, doctor, but I can't, I'm too tired, I just can't get going. And so they get into this downward spiral where they can't exercise because they're too tired, they become deconditioned, and then it's harder to exercise. So. The, the idea behind the uh, FES bicycle is that it provides electrical stimulation to the muscles and helps them to contract, so it actually assists the patient in doing the exercise. 
And after several weeks of this, a funny thing happens. The patients actually, their muscles feel tighter and they become conditioned. They get the benefits of the aerobic conditioning, the well-being that happens after we exercise and release um, endorphins that make us feel good. And then they, they break that cycle and they start to have a little bit more energy and they can start participating in the uh, exercise. So I think this is a very practical approach and uh, we're starting a trial right now for secondary progressive MS where we're putting people on these bicycles three times a week and seeing how much exercise they have to do to get better. That's remarkable. You know, it's, John. It's, it's interesting because it's kind of in some way counterintuitive. People think that if you do exercise, you're going to get more fatigued. And many years ago, the approach to fatigue was to not exercise. But what we're learning is actually doing some mild exercise actually can reduce fatigue. So it might seem counterintuitive to, to the patient. But that's really a, a, some, uh, something that can be reduced with exercise, let alone some of the other things you were talking about, Peter. Terrific. Well, um, Danny, um, what are some of the things that we don't know about progression that imaging can help us with? There's unfortunately a lot we don't know about progression, uh, but a lot we have learned, and a lot of the ways we've learned it is through imaging. Um, so I go to um, meetings with colleagues who are working also on imaging, just like we are in our lab, um, and here's a couple of things they're talking about and that I think we're making great progress on. Um, one is what Peter mentioned, uh, is the ability to look directly at the myelin um, in the brain, uh, in the optic nerve, and even in the spinal cord. Uh, there are some new technologies that are being developed um, to do that, various ones that are in various stages of testing, but I think as new drugs are being tested that can help improve the myelination, we'll be able um, soon in the near future to be to, to look specifically at whether those drugs are, are working and so I think that's 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 one great area of promise another area that's that's I think pretty important uh, and that's gotten a lot of attention in the last few years is the gray matter what is the gray matter the gray matter is the part of the brain where the bodies of the nerve cells live we talk a lot about the nerve wires which are surrounded by the myelin uh, but the nerve cells also have bodies and they live in the gray matter and you may hear about structures like the cortex or the thalamus um, and for a long time it was thought that most of the disease is happening along the wires and with the myelin but we know a lot of it is also happening in the gray matter with the the cell bodies um, and that turns out to be a lot harder of a, um, of a job to, to, to take good pictures of with imaging. And yet there are new techniques for seeing directly the damage that's occurring uh, in the gray matter, um, both as it's happening uh, and, and down the road as, as some of these cells are, are being lost. And, and, and there are more and more reports that even some of the existing drugs um, uh, that have been approved um, can slow down the rate at which the gray matter um, is damaged. Um, and the third thing that I think we are um, working hard at is being able to use imaging to make predictions for individual patients. Now I think we're a long way off from being able to do that well, uh, but it's something a lot of people are, are really interested in being able to do, to say, um, and, and we don't even know how long it'll take, but, but, but to be able to say based on um, even a, a few years of, uh, of imaging somebody um, what their prognosis is. Um, that's that's a, 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 a goal that we have and, and that people are working on. So if I understand you correctly, what you're saying is at some point in the future, uh, someone could see, come and see you or, or Peter, and, and the, on the basis of, of their MRI images, you'd be able to help them get a better prognosis for what, what's going to happen with the disease and what treatment may or may not be effective for them? It's certainly one of our goals. There's a, a big uh, push um, from the director of the National Institutes of Health um, uh, to towards something called personalized medicine, um, where uh, we know that people have a disease, but the disease expresses itself differently in each person. Um, how do we understand that? That has something to do with genes. It has something to do with um, uh, medicines and, and, and all sorts of things. Um, and uh, imaging is certainly one of the tools we can use to understand how the disease impacts each person. There are other tools as well and we need to be able to integrate that um, in order to understand each specific person's disease. 
So, Peter, what would that mean for you as a physician who sees a lot of uh, people with MS? How would that change your practice? Well, of course, it would be great if we had better tools. Uh, I think we're, it's happening, though. Uh, we already use the MRI of the brain and the spinal cord. Uh, we know people have a lot of spinal cord involvement, that they might be more likely to become progressive, and so we, we weight that a, a little bit more. And now we're using the eye imaging device to, to look at neurons right in the back of the eye and, and see if they have damage directly to the neurons, uh, that's a location where there's no myelin. So it, that's starting to teach us that maybe not the whole response is directed against uh, areas of, of demyelination, but there may be other things going on where the immune system directly attacks nerves. And I think that, that we're going to have blood tests and imaging devices that really guide what specific type of MS uh, the patient has. And Danny, is, is, the, is the imaging of the spinal cord something that's going to become more common in MS? I know people typically have uh, an image of their brain, but what about the spinal cord? Yeah, well, I think now people get imaging of the spinal cord if they have an attack that the doctor thinks is coming from the spinal cord, but not routinely. Why is that? That's because the spinal cord is really small. It's sort of the, about the size of my thumb. Um, and it's very hard as a result to take really good pictures of it. So I would say that the state of spinal cord imaging is probably 10 or 20 years behind the state of imaging of the brain. Um, and yet uh, there are a lot of uh, good studies that have been done recently um, showing a much better depiction of the plaques in the spinal cord, much better pictures than we had before. Um, we're also learning about uh, how um, the spinal cord can uh, atrophy just as the brain can, and we're uh, developing ways of measuring that. Um, and I think people are, are finding um, with those techniques, with other techniques uh, such as diffusion MRI, which is something we've been working on in our group to look at the spinal cord, um, that we can understand um, much better, uh, though not perfectly yet, um, how uh, an individual's disease relates to the damage that's occurred. I'm going to interrupt just for a second. Danny's being modest here. And when he was at Hopkins, he helped develop a diffusion tensor imaging protocol in the spinal cord that has really changed how we think about uh, imaging the spinal cord. And we're, we're starting to find that it's not just the plaques, but under, underlying the plaques in the normal appearing part of the cord that the, this DTI technique picks up abnormalities that uh, someday we're going to be using in the clinic. It's something we did together. <laughs> He's starting to write. This is great. John, um, your institution helps people with... Uh, many different types of rehabilitation needs. Um, are there things that you're learning from people who experience a stroke or spinal cord injury that uh, can be applied to help improve function of people who live with MS? Oh, yes, absolutely, Tim. You know, um, the rehabilitation approach is the uh, approach to treat the whole person. Uh, and we don't necessarily treat singular, singular uh, populations, but we treat uh, function, disabilities, and we look at abilities. So, for example, in the area of spinal cord, we've had, we do a technique uh, that's been around for a few years now called locomotor training, where we do this very intensive training of the, uh, of the, uh, the legs, and, and doing this over 70 sessions of taking people who haven't walked in years out of the wheelchair and walking for the first time. It's really phenomenal to see that. Not sure how that would work with MS, but certainly if you, if you deal with mobility, you're not necessarily dealing with a clinical population, so it's, there's possibility with that. Uh, another area we, in our organization, for example, we do a lot of research on medical adherence. I'm sorry, um, um, adherence to medication regimens, and uh, it's particularly in, in, important in stroke. Uh, and, and if you don't adhere to your medication regimens, you know these help, helping with uh, these parameters to help the disease may not work. And we know that's a problem in MS as well. For instance, people who feel like their medicines are not having an effect will tend to start to slack off and take in their medications. They're not adhering to their regimens. And because some of these things you don't see, they can take a long period of time. And so uh, medication adherence is something we study, which is a really important thing. And the cognitive work that we do is not just in MS. We do a lot of work with in stroke and, and TBI. And um, learning how these various cognitive techniques can significantly improve learning and memory, but not just that, using things like DTI. There are actual changes structurally in the brain and functionally with these behavioral interventions that we're applying, not in just uh, MS, but working with our colleagues in TBI as well. So it's a really exciting time. All right. So, uh, Peter, you know, another question that asks is, 
you know, um, how, the question is, how would repair therapies help if a person has underlying MS? You know, wouldn't, wouldn't the disease process that's causing the damage just come back again and, you know, actually reverse the, the, the repair and just cause new damage on top of that? Well, it's a great point, and uh, as Danny talked about, uh, there are t uh, several things happening at once. So there's the inflammation, and then very early on in the disease, we can see in some people the beginnings of the, the nerve damage happening. Uh, and so uh, e even if we were to develop a way to remyelinate, we were still going to have to stop the inflammation and the attack. So this is why um, I think we're really going to be looking at combination approaches where we are always trying to optimize the anti-inflammatory, reduce the relapses, stop the inflammation, and at the same time, enhance the recovery process. Okay. And Danny, um, how can imaging be applied uh, to efforts to, to actually repair, to see the repair that's happening in, in MS? Well, we've talked a little about myelin. Um, to expand on that a little bit, it turns out that um, there's a, a, a water that's um, inside the layers of myelin that we can see with the MRI. Um, and that uh, kind of water is something we can, we can detect to see if myelin is getting better. We didn't talk as much about looking directly at the nerve wires. Um, um, I mentioned that we see that they um, can be damaged and lost. Um, but the challenge for us is really to be able to detect um, nerve wires and nerve cell bodies that are, are sick but not yet gone. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and there are a variety of, of new technologies that are being developed to look just at that. One of the most uh, promising of those um, is a technique that, that Peter mentioned called optical coherence tomography, which gives us really detailed pictures of the back of the eye that doesn't use an MRI at all. It just uses light inside the eye, and, and Peter could talk a little bit more about that. And we will. I, you know, I have a, a one question that comes to mind often that people ask me, and that's, you know, some patients with primary progressive MS get worse at a slower rate over many years, and other people get worse at a much faster rate. Do we know what causes this different course for different people? I personally think that uh, when people are getting uh, worse quickly, that it, it probably you know, means that there's inflammation going on. And so I, I look very carefully, and even if I can't find it by imaging, sometimes we'll try to ramp up on their uh, anti-inflammatory treatments or give them a course of steroids because usually neurodegeneration plays out over many years to decades. And so if someone's getting worse over months, uh, then that might be a red flag that there's more of an inflammatory process going on. Dan, Annie? Oh, I would agree with that completely. Okay. Well, let me ask uh, both of you. Um, also, another question is, what else do you think um, needs to be done to find treatments for progressive MS? Is there something out there that uh, we're missing? Well, a variety of things. So I, I think we need to collaborate with people in other fields uh, because there are a lot of bright scientists who work on other diseases that have ideas that uh, they may uh, be ahead of us in. We need to think about repurposing drugs like we talked about, FDA drugs that carry an indication for another disease and screen them with high throughput screens for neuroprotection or remyelination and take those to the clinic. We need better imaging outcome measures to, to open up the, the block and the, the pipeline between target discovery in the laboratory and the phase two proof of concept clinical trial. I think that's a, a real area where things slow down and, and right now for remyelination there's only one drug uh, because I think a lot of people are nervous that we don't quite know how to do it yet. Uh, and so we need to put a lot of emphasis on these early phase trials. Um, and we need to keep an open mind. I, I think that we need to look for the breakthroughs, the, the paradigm shifting uh, experiments, and uh, modern technologies have provided us with new tools to really uh, look at the brain and spinal cord in a different way. And so I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, in addition to the slow incremental uh, progress that we're making that uh, we'll have some breakthroughs along the way that will really change how we think about this disease. Okay. Great. Let me ask John quickly your, your thoughts on, on what we might be missing or what we need to look at. You know, I think we need to, um, I would say from my perspective, look at uh, environmental in, in, um, ways to improve uh, the expression of the disease. I think that there are a lot of things we can do with that. I think a lot of work is going to come from imaging. How, how, we, how does the brain change with these kinds of interventions? And I think that's going to be really promising. And you know, I guess the other question is: Is uh, are there you know worldwide efforts uh, going on in progressive MS, Danny? Your your thoughts? Do you have collaborators outside of? Uh... 
I do. I have. Yes. I do. I have um, collaborators in Holland, uh, collaborators in Israel, um, and uh, and uh, we're thinking about the same problems on both sides of the Atlantic, both sides of the Pacific, um, mm -hmm. related to progressive MS. Um, I would echo what what Peter said about collaboration um, as being a, a critical component of how we can approach this. Um, we just last week had a, a, an initial meeting of a, a group of imaging scientists um, with the goal of trying to get together to, to work on some problems together. Um, and uh, ultimately, we hope to develop new ways of, of testing drugs quickly with imaging. Um, the Europeans are way ahead of us on this. We have a little bit of catch up to do. Um, but, but I think it's a pretty promising development that, uh, that hopefully will we'll move things along at a faster clip. Great. Well, before we wrap up, I'd like to ask each of you your final thoughts on uh, understanding and treating progressive MS. John, I want to start with you. Well, I'd say, you know, for the patients with MS is to take some more control. Take some more control into their treatment. Work with their physicians and with their team, but also do what they can and be open to a number of these other kinds of new interventions, exercise and cognitive stimulation. I think that's going to be a big step and with these new treatments and these new ways of looking at the brain I think you're going to be able to see that taking active control is going to have a benefit. Mm -hmm. Great. Danny? Well, uh, we don't yet have a cure. Um, we, uh, we don't even have really great treatments but despite all that I think there's been no um, better or more hopeful uh, time uh, for for people um, with the disease and even with the progressive disease because of all of the things we've been talking about here. Um, we need more research. Um, the MS Society and the NIH recognize this. Um, we need to, to think outside the box. We need to pursue promising leads. Um, but, uh, uh, and, but, and, but there's still a lot of work to be done. Great. So, Peter, some final thoughts. Well, I'd like to emphasize that we really are making a lot of progress. And so, uh, you know, 20 years ago when I started this uh, disease, we, we didn't have any FDA-approved uh, treatments, and so it was a very frustrating time. And now we have eight or, or nine, depending on how you, you count them. And so um, I think we are making progress. But the real message for people with progressive MS is that uh, the progress is happening at the preclinical level. And by that, I mean that the treatments that we have right now for relapsing MS came out of scientific projects, many funded by the National MS Society in the 70s and 80s, and that led to those treatments coming on the market in the 90s. Uh, the treatments that we will have for progressive MS, the groundwork is already being laid. So for the last decade, uh, the MS Society has been funding researchers to better understand remyelination, neuroprotection, how this all happens, how we can target it, and the targets have been identified. Uh, many of the, the drugs have been made or identified and are starting to go into clinical trials. So I think that we are going to start reaping the benefits of all this research in the next decade. That's, uh, well, thank you. This is a really inspiring perspectives. So we've heard today that to develop better treatments for every type of progressive MS, we have to gain a better understanding of the underlying mechanisms that drive progression. Our scientific advisors are helping us map out a course of action to move this work forward quickly. Um, we're also working to design new ways to conduct clinical trials and to develop better outcome measures of the kind that Peter talked about to speed up the testing of promising therapies and, and promising repair strategies. But in the meantime, we've heard today that there are clinical trials going on right now in progressive MS. and There are rehabilitation techniques that can help people take charge of their many symptoms. Additionally, we're working with a global consortium to propel specific elements of this work that will go faster through international collaboration. There is a lot of work to do in progressive MS, but there are also unprecedented opportunities to achieve advancements that will make a big difference in people's lives. We will be continuing our conversation on progressive MS in a live community chat on June 18th on our msconnection.org website. Check it out for more information on how you can participate I also want to thank our panelists, Danny, John, and Peter, for being here today and sharing your expertise with us. I also want to thank our viewers for joining us and let everyone know that your, if your question wasn't answered, please speak directly with your healthcare provider or visit the Society's website at nationalmssociety.org or contact our, our Information Resource Center and speak with one of our MS navigators at one 800 344 4867. 
Thank you all, and good night from New York.